Today, a few things I wish I'd learned about ministry before I finally did. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. Now, I, uh, I, I turned 60 recently, and, you know, it's a moment of reflection. <laughs> and, and so, I've, you know, I've looked back at things that have changed in my view about the world, my experiences in the world, and how they've shaped me and so on. And uh, as a result of that, uh, it's, you know, it's producing these couple of episodes uh, of self-reflection. And so, I, you know, you can, I, I hope it will be of value to you. I will say, I, I'm saying it's about ministry. It is about ministry, and it's about church vocational ministry and my experience in it. But I, I, I think it would be interesting to people who are not in church vocational ministry uh, since we see these things all the time from both sides of the pulpit, uh, and it wouldn't matter whether you're in ministry or not, I don't think, uh, to benefit from some of these things that took me way too many decades uh, to benefit from. So, um, you know, let's just, let's just talk about a few of these things. And I'll try to give uh, some examples along the way of what actually transpired in my life. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to start and end uh, at the same point. Uh, which is when uh, learning when not to laugh in, in ministry. This was important for me because uh, we were we were a, a jocular family, you know. So I I mean I grew up with sarcasm and every sharp witted uh, statement, utterance, joke, whatever you could come up with. You communicated it. That was just, you know, we just did that. And so we were, I, and I, I think there's a lot of energy and vitality in that. I still love, uh, you know, people who have a good sense of humor. I can't say I have a good sense of humor. I just have one, but whatever it is, I've got it. And so I, it, so it's, it was important for me at some point, and, and it, I, I don't know if I said this before, but, you know, I was called to ministry when I was 13 years old. I didn't care that I was, but I was. I knew I was. I knew I should give my life to ministry. Uh, when I was 16, I actually heard and yielded to the call to give my life to church vocational ministry. Reticently, reluctantly, but I did it. And since then, no reticence at all. That's been everything I've done. It's all been about how to be in ministry. So by the time I was out of college, I had already been preaching regularly for five, for four years and, uh, and, I, and I mean, I, by the time I was 18, I was preaching pretty much every week, and most of the time, three times a week, and from then until now. Uh, so it's, it's just been my experience to be in ministry. And so by the time I was 24 and I was pastoring a, a mainline church, had a full-time ministry position, you know, I was still a kid. 24 years old is awfully young to be pastoring a congregation, especially a congregation of 50 and 60 year olds and up and uh, and we had others who came with me to that congregation but you know it was a, it was a lot of people who had a lot of life experience that I didn't have and so uh, one of the things I learned and, and again I'll start and end the episode with something about when not to laugh that I had to learn um, the hard way in some ways so when not to laugh the first episode the first part of this episode is this one I had to learn when not to laugh uh, when others are hurting. So this is weird, and I, you know, but this is what happened. So a, a lady called me from the church. She wasn't exactly a member, but she came all the time. And she called me from the church and, and uh, called me at the church and uh, shared with me that, that uh, this person uh, so-and-so had died. And so so-and-so has, has passed away, you know, and they were crying. They were very upset. And so I was, oh, it's a great opportunity to do ministry. I'm very concerned. And so I uh, get in the car and I drive all the way to the other side of town and other end of town. And uh, I get there and go in. We talk. And we, I, I bet we talked for 15 minutes 
before uh, it finally came out that so-and-so who had passed away was a cat instead of a human being. It took me that long. First of all, it took me that long to figure it out because this person, you know, everybody in their life knew who, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember what the cat's name was, but it was obviously a human-sounding name to me. And so the moment I realized it was a cat, I, I did it. I burst out laughing. I couldn't help it. I thought she'd lost a father or brother or, you know, somebody, a per, you know, somebody that walks on two legs, that kind of person. You know what I mean? Not a cat. And, I, and again, I'm cat. I say that like they're disgusting. I'm happy people have cats, okay? I learned much later when I was on the radio, dec- a couple of decades later when I was on the radio, I learned how much people love their animals. And I take good care of my animals, too. And I'm going to get off this subject because I'm going to dig a hole for myself. But the, but, but the thing is, I did an episode on the radio uh, many years ago where we talked about the souls of animals and what happens with them and the difference between them and people. And I'm not going to say what I said then because I don't want, I don't need the response I got then. (laughs) And and I, I, that was the, I did, I did radio for 10 years, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, 10 years, different topics every day, 10 years. That was the most responded to show that I did in those 10 years because people want their animals to go to heaven with them. And they don't, it doesn't matter whether the Bible says that's going to happen or not. And I'm not even saying today because I don't want to wrestle with anybody about it. So I did not grasp when I was 24 years old. And I, and I didn't, I, it was just a, it was an automatic reaction of relief. Oh, it wasn't your father or your brother or whoever it is. It was a, it was a cat. <laughs> oh, so and the devastation on their face when I laughed when they were hurting uh, taught me a lesson I I learned for the rest of my life. It didn't matter whether I thought it was trivial that a cat died or not. It wasn't trivial to her, and I don't. And I respond differently now uh, to the hurting that's going on in other people. And again, you know, you're 24 years old. You're just not. You're not, you're not processing things, so I hope you'll forgive me and not write me off as a calloused and, uh, you know, spiritually dead individual because I did that. I, I learned. I learned from that lesson that you can't control how important emotionally, how important an event is for someone else. It just is what it is. And, and, and serving other people because they're in that, in that state is still the serving of a human being who does bear the image of God and a person who's in that state. I remember, in fact, a, a pastor, uh, not uh, just recently, after a, one of the hurricanes that happened recently, there was a lot of uh, shipping and flying pets out of the hurricane region and back to safe areas or wherever their owners were, something like that. And this pastor spent uh, a pretty good bit of time in some sermon on a getting sidetracked and talking about how absurd it was that people were trying to get their pets to safety while people were still suffering. I understand his point. I, I, I'm not offended by his point, but I did think to myself, you're not, you're not thinking all the way through this one because one of the ways you can serve people is by meeting their emotional needs during a crisis, and just recognizing that also, I mean, I may be right or wrong about that, and I don't know whether he was right or wrong in what he said. I'm just making the point that learning when not to laugh (laughs) affected my view about a lot of things regarding the importance of things to other people. See, being able to step into someone else's shoes and understand that to them, this is an experience that needs to be respected in the moment. Okay, well, we'll get to other stuff like that in a minute. Okay, so let me give a, uh, so some of this, some of this conversation today will be, I I guess it'll come across in the form of advice or something like that. I I don't mean for it just to be advice. It's just stuff that I learned over the years and I found interesting and maybe it'll be helpful to you as well. And then uh, we'll talk about some of the fun stuff also at the end, but also some more serious stuff. Um, So one, you know, in ministry, some of the stuff that I've learned over the 44 years that I've been uh, committed to ministry, the 40, I don't know, yeah, 40, I guess that's about right, 42 years that I've been actively leading in ministry in one kind or, of one kind or another, 
Uh, one of the things, that, now that I've turned 60, I'm saying all of this, one of the things that, uh, that I've learned just has to do with ministry leadership, like how do, you, how do you manage things? How do you run a ministry? How do you organize uh, events or programs or, you know, work with people and so on? And, and one of the things I've learned with those just has to do with uh, my own attitude about things and priorities about things. And so, uh, one of those th- one of those lessons learned. And I'll, I'll put it this way: it has to do with how you how you uh, put things next to each other. Uh, I've learned to prioritize balance. I'll use the word balance. I'll explain what I mean for you in a minute. Over simplicity, uh, and I get the value of simplicity. Uh, I'm I, this this will explain to you why I'm such a terrible marketer. I'm not a, I'm not great at marketing uh, or anything like that. Creating titles for the ep- these episodes is like a nightmare to me, and I'm grateful that our producer does it instead. Daisy does that instead. I I, I can't do stuff like that, I'm, or I'm not effective at it. Uh, and I I think one of the reasons is I pref- I just don't I I don't think that way automatically and then I have to really backtrack and go back over a bunch of stuff to make it happen it just seems like too much work and so I don't but the ba- so what I mean by this balance over simplicity is that over time I came to realize that most mi- and ministry just serving people you know most ministry responsibilities entail tension. And because of that, and they entail tension because life is complicated, and whatever you do is complicated. And I can say, I, well, I'm not going to give money to homeless people because they'll spend it on drugs, so I'm just going to buy them food. Well, I mean, it's the same thing as saying I'm not going to send my taxes to pay for abortion. I'm going to do it for something else. I mean, the money just gets moved around. So if I'm buying them, if I'm buying them a meal, I'm making it so they don't have to spend their money on a meal, and they've got it available for their drugs. Part of the reality of ministry, because people are complicated and circumstances are complicated, and nothing is monolithic, nothing is monochromatic. Everything in life is in full chaotic, maybe snow-like color. You know, thinking of old TVs. Most ministry responsibilities entail tension, and that means that most ministry decisions and most of the decisions we have to make as individuals about who we're going to serve and how we're going to serve them and and what we're going to prioritize in the way we talk about things is is going to require balance, not this singular way of describing everything that exists as having only one way of being described. Simple solutions... I know this, simple solutions do satisfy, and they sell better, and they sound better, right? But they do it at the expense of reality. And I'm not saying that we can't understand things. I'm not saying everything is a deep intellectual well that requires years of studying the Greek, if you want to know. I'm not saying that. But it can require a balance. So, for instance, I'll give you you some examples on my personal demeanor. I, again, I've mentioned I, I, I like humor. I love humor. Uh, I love listening to comedians. I love interacting with surprisingly f- with things that knock you off your, your game and, and are funny. I enjoy that. I enjoy uh, word games, even in very serious moments they come out from me. That's my nature. I have learned over time that there's there that you have to balance that with gravity. And of course, I recognize the sobriety and gravity that's assumed in scripture of a person who's capable of leading ministry, literally supposed to be grave, uh, have gravity, be able to take seriously the things that are serious. And so part of our demeanor as believers and as servants is to be capable of respecting the things that require gravity in the moment. But at the same time, I think levity is important, the opposite of gravity, the, the ability to have a good sense of humor about things. Uh, back, you know, back when I was on the radio, I, I did a couple of series on Ten Commandments of a Christian Worldview, we called it. And one of the things I, I gave then as a commandment was the ability to recognize that there's only one God and I'm not him. You know, that, that, was, a, that was one of the commandments, you know, to, just to grasp. And uh, I think the point in that statement, which I find mildly humorous anyway, I didn't originate it, I I can't remember where I got it from, 
but which I find that statement mildly humorous. I think one of the ideas that undergirds that statement or that reinforced it for me was learning to take God very seriously, learning to take very seriously things of holiness, and then ourselves, not so much. Because while God is very serious and while the Holy Spirit is powerful and while Jesus is Lord, I'm not. And so my ability to discern the difference between the two is partially expressed in a little humor. And I think that's a really helpful thing. But having only humor, mm, not so helpful because there is a holiness about God that should make us fall on our faces. Uh, And having only gravity, mm, not so good because as perfect and pure as God is, I'm not. And the confusion that a lot of people come to, and, and believe me, I know some very serious-minded uh, people who've given themselves to ministry, and partially it's because they've confused the truth of Scripture with their application of it. They've confused the authority of God with their authority. And I, don't, I think that's a dangerous thing. I think it's more helpful to be able to balance between the two, gravity and and levity. Writing sermons, for instance, same way. I have to balance between the time I spend on expositing a passage, which is, oh, just heaven for me. I mean, just burying your head in a passage. I get the similarity between saying that and saying that was intentional. The, 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 the joy I get in that and the fact that time just stops. I just love it. I love studying the details of a passage like that also requires, if I'm going to be a servant of people, and that's what God's called me to be, not just a servant of his word, I'm a servant of people. So I'm standing between the two. I need to give equal time to studying them and to figuring out how to create the rhetoric that allows me to speak to them well. And that's that's much more of a challenge for me uh, because I don't find the same joy and satisfaction in that. I do find some because I've learned to do it over the years in a better way, and so I find it more satisfying than I used to. But it is, uh, it is a challenge to balance those two. And I know people who are brilliant at the rhetoric, and they, and they have fluff in their content because they don't spend any time studying the Word. And I know people who are brilliant in their exposition, and nobody can really grasp, it, you know, w- within, a, within an hour of the sermon, nobody can really grasp what they said because it was just so complicated. Uh, that happens on both sides when we decide that we can do only one or the other. But I think finding balance in that uh, is, you know, it's just a, it's a lesson of a long life. You know, it's part of what goes with it. It's getting longer and longer, like a lot of my sermons, by the way. Also serving people. And this one's easy. I, I, I won't dwell on it. I've done whole episodes on this one. But, you know, evangelism, reaching out to new people and sharing with them. And I don't even mean evangelism. Forget evangelism. I don't mean that. I mean eternal life. Uh, the value and priority of thinking about eternal life when we're sharing it with the the gospel with other people, uh, sharing Christ with other people, and we want them to live forever. That's good, and that's a priority, and it's important in Scripture. I I value that. But at the same time, we're supposed to do social ministry. We're supposed to do things in this world. So it's really eternal life and temporal life. The idea that we're supposed to pit the two against each other is completely wrong-headed. The whole nature of the Beatitudes is to say, because we prioritize eternity, we change the way we live here. That's the, that's the nature of the relationship between the... I said I was going to preach on that. I'm not. So there's the example. And uh, also in terms of ministry leadership, um, I learned this. I, I, I was just talking about balance over simplicity, um, that idea in three different ways. But then I also learned patience over victory. Um, and, you know, what I mean by that is I, I was a debater when I was in junior high and high school. So for me, judgments came immediately. <laughs> you know, we would, we would debate the topic. And we weren't trying to persuade the other person. We were trying to persuade the judge, obviously, the audience. And we did. We won our debates. So that means uh, by the end of the day, at least, but most of the time within 10 minutes, uh, we knew the verdict and uh, we were good to move on. We won. Okay, move on. And that's not the way conversations uh, that are meaningful in, in, in life and ministry 
uh, actually happen, and it's certainly not the way we exercise influence as a leader in church ministry or any other kind of uh, leadership that's actually uh, consequential. And so I, you know, I have said to younger uh, people coming into the ministry sometimes, uh, when they're anticipating a a, tr- a a rough business meeting or a troubling business meeting, that one of the words of advice I have for them is simply uh, recognize that you don't need to win right now. You don't need to have this victory. Uh, and there are a couple of things I'll say to try to help them through that process because it's it's really frustrating and difficult to lose when you're arguing about or disagreeing about or trying to lead regarding things that are so essential to what you believe you're called to do, right? So it's really hard to let that stuff go. But in some ways, it's essential because uh, it's not like Jesus says to Peter, hey, if you deny me, you're out. You know, we're done. And Peter denies him three times. And Jesus still has a purpose for him. And Peter does come to himself. And Peter is the person who's leading the church after the ascension and the commissioning and, you know, all of the Pentecost stuff and so on, (laughs) the Pentecost stuff and so on. Anyway, you get the idea. And so I I will say to them, you know, one one thing that can just help with your attitude uh, when you're facing a conflict in a congregation or even just somebody coming into your office with conflict is uh, to visualize what, what the future is going to look like if you lose this and make it okay. Make it okay that you can walk out not having to win that argument or discussion or debate or business meeting or issue or whatever it is. And once you've done that, it's remarkable how much less anxiety there is in the discussion. I wish I did it every time, but at least I've learned that I can do that and that it helps. But then that just helps with the attitude coming toward it. The reality of it is that people don't stop thinking about what you've been talking about just because you stopped talking about it. (laughs) Now, that's presuming that you have an honest conversation with them and that they actually, you know, are willing to engage in the conversation, which means that you have listened to them and that they believe that you are not trying to harm them or control them or things like that. And so if you have an honest conversation with somebody, a genuine conversation with them, they may leave saying, yeah, I don't see that. I just, I just don't see it. I don't just, I don't agree with that. I, we're just gonna, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree. One of my least favorite lines in all of history, but it does make sense. It's a reasonable line. I just don't like it. Anyway, the point is, yeah, so we say you hear all of that and you think, well, that was a waste. No, I mean, people sleep on it and they are chewing their food and they go, oh, I never thought about that. Or they read a news story or something happens to them, which had never happened to them before, and suddenly everything's in a different light and the words suddenly mean something. And let's say they're not, they, they don't have it in them, and I mean literally in whatever way, for whatever reason, they don't have it in them to remember that you were the one who planted the idea. Let's say you never get credit for it and they never come back to you and say, you know, you won that debate. Maybe they just change their mind and they think it came to them as, you know, the voice of an angel in the night. You know, somebody, God convinced me that, and you're like, well, I mean, I'm glad to be the voice of God, but that was me. Uh, That's what we want to say. But in, in reality, does it really matter that it came from us? And so that sense for me of learning uh, to, to aim for something longer term, to value patience, over winning in the moment it was a huge lesson has been a huge lesson and i'm and i am still learning it i mean it's hard in the moment uh, when we get caught up in the fury of a discussion uh, it's very difficult to live that out for me uh, and I, I am competitive in conversations i mean that's just uh, my nature comes out in those things but uh, the more i've learned this the more i've realized that that's where real change takes place so patience over victory that's what i mean one more under ministry leadership, and then we'll change topics for a second. Uh, one more is uh, valuing tension over resolution. Uh, this one I started learning when I was in my PhD program, uh, and not in the context of ministry at all, but just the idea of creative tension, uh, any kind of creative tension. I had a, a discourse analysis professor. I, I don't think I've shared this on any of our episodes yet, uh, and yet it was really influential on me. I had a, I had a professor in my 
uh, seminar on discourse analysis who would walk into the classroom just the first few times, but before we had ever met him, he did this the very first time he ever walked into the classroom. There were probably eh, 20 or 25 of us uh, in this particular seminar or class, and uh, we, we were sitting around a big table, and uh, everybody had their books open in front of them and so on, and so we were chattering away, you know, you're, you're doing this when you expect to finish, are you working on your, you know, whatever yet? And, uh, and then the professor walks in, really, uh, really interesting guy, but for a lot of reasons. But anyway, he walked in and he sat down, this tall, thin man, and he sat in the most prominent chair in the room. So it was obvious he was the professor. He had come in to be the professor. He had all the things that said, I'm the professor. And he had not said a word. And he sat down at the end of the table and he put his materials in front of him and he put his hands on the materials and he looked up patiently and calmly and sort of looked around the room. And then after he'd looked all the way around the room, I don't think he made eye contact, but it was close, uh, looking around the room, he just continued to sit there and just sat there and sat there and sat there. And we got more and more uncomfortable until I don't even remember who broke the silence, but somebody, a student, finally said, um, are you, I think it was Dr. Reddick, um, and, you know, and we went from, I don't know what they said, but it was something like that. You know, it's what you would expect a student to say. And then he just engaged in the conversation and went on going. And part of it was to make the point that, uh, it, because if you're doing discourse analysis, part of the interesting thing about discourse is that it always involves some kind of engagement. There's always some opening act in it. And the other thing uh, is that uh, the na human nature requires uh, the disruption of this awkward silence, right? So we, always, we call it awkward silence. Uh, somebody has to break the tension. And so I learned the concept of creative tension, that sometimes you want to you wanna, you wanna have an environment where you don't resolve the tension. You require someone else to do it, where you don't make everything okay. You expect them to make it okay. And this, this, this helped me in so many different ways, uh, realizing that I didn't have to resolve every conflict so that the other person felt perfectly peaceable, when it might be important for them to take time to just figure out what had happened and, and work through it themselves. I'm not saying to punish them. This is nothing like that. This is working toward a better solution. So the idea of tension for me became a term that wasn't inherently negative, in my college years, but the further I went along in ministry, in actual ministry, the more I realized that I had learned, because in public speaking, in terms of oratory, forget preaching, just public speaking, in terms of oratory and even my debate speeches, over time I became better at doing this on the fly, I had learned to build them to a crescendo, so that by the time you were at the end, everything was resolved so perfectly that I wanted my audience basically to sit back and go, oh, well, well, that was the greatest thing I've ever heard. Nobody could ever disagree with that, and everything's done. And everybody feels good, and it's like that's the answer that we were looking for. I had learned to, I, I didn't say I ever achieved it. I'm saying that's what I had learned to work toward. And in my, in a, and in my early preaching and teaching, I, I sort of felt the same way, like I needed to get everybody to the delivery. I needed to get everyone to the, the great moment, the bang of the fireworks, and they would all leave cheering and shouting and carrying, you know, whoever out on their shoulders, you know, it's the great win, that's all. And it, it took me forever to realize that, that by doing that, I was ending the impact of that moment in the moment. I was closing it off instead of giving people a reason to walk out and need to do something, to walk out and find something else to finish what we had only begun in that moment. And so, the, you know, for, having the big invitation is good. I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that churches do invitations. I don't think it's always necessary to do a formal invitation. I think it's always right to invite some kind of transformation, obviously, is the point. But how you do it, I used to do in the programmatic way to make sure everybody came forward and got everything resolved, when what I really needed was not, was not a public decision. What I really needed was for a person to carry it home and ruminate uh, on it for a week and for a long time 
work out what it would look like to actually live that and to have, if anything, if they carried anything home with them from the message itself, it would be a, a phrase or an unresolved illustration or something that would make them think, how, how do I fix that? How do I solve it? And then actually start doing it. And so I, you know, for, for instance, I was in a peer group a few years later in, in my ministry, and uh, it taught me that uh, rather than just you know, using your sermon as a, as a means to show off, obviously, or just even to teach. Instead, you use it as an opportunity to introduce this whole pattern. So yeah, you teach something, you, you elicit something from the passage that says we, we ought to do this or we ought to think this way, but then you give them an opportunity to do it. And so this afternoon when you go home, blah, 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 you know, do something. And we did that a few times. Go memorize this passage and then, and then report back on it so that tonight, hey, if you've memorized the passage and you want to share it with everybody, come back and we'll memorize and we'll, and we'll share the passage together. And that opportunity, not only to learn something when people came, but then to go practice it in a certain way that had been, that it, that had been explained to them, and then to come back and have some accountability in a positive sense, just positive feedback, transformed what I was seeing impact the people who were under my ministry, right? Just, and that was just before I, started, I came to Criswell College as a professor in 2004. This was just before that. And, and it was an important realization for me that my goal was not to find resolution in a moment whether in a counseling session, like I, I just did pastoral counseling with people. I don't mean therapeutic, you know, licensed counseling. Whether in a, in a, in a counseling session with a couple or in a message at a, at a, at a worship service or at a camp uh, or whatever it was, or, or just in a conversation in, in a, you know, on the way out of the building, uh, I realized that I didn't need to resolve it in that moment. But sometimes to allow the tension to remain so that we could be more creative in finding uh, the more permanent impact that should have. Anyway, there you go. So on ministry leadership, that's some of the stuff. And uh, just looking at, you know, 60 years or 44 or, four, you know, 42 in ministry of different kinds, uh, what that, you know, what that, what that has meant to me and how it's changed the way I do ministry and the way I think about trying to lead in ministry. In other words, you know, I'll give another set of examples here. But this time, not about just ministry leadership in general, but about the relationship between Scripture and ministry. My uh, way of relating to Scripture has changed, and I think a lot of people, uh, I, I wish a lot of us would recognize this change. And in some cases, I have seen this in a lot of people. In others, I, I still haven't seen it. And so, I, you know, like an initial observation would simply be to say this, confidence in the Word in Scripture itself, confidence in Scripture, is not the same as obedience to Scripture. I was, in, and honestly, I learned, I started learning this early. I was in high school when I remember, because I, I know I was only in high school because I, re, I remember the floor I was laying on. It was still in our old house that I was in when I was a teenager. And I was laying on the floor and, and looking up and thinking about it and thinking, I've heard a lot of sermons about how firmly we believe in the Bible. And so now I firmly believe the Bible, and I'm not sure what it says other than what I've read in it. In other words, all the sermons I'm hearing are about the confidence, not about what we obey from the Scripture itself. Uh, I, <laughs> I had a friend that I preached for a bunch of times in revival up in uh, Mem uh, near the Memphis area, north of there, and uh, one, one particular friend at a church, not the one I was talking about in the last episode with the uh, racial issues that I discussed, a different one. But he did create some of those connections for me. He was a, he was a really great guy, good friend. Uh, anyway, he would tease me. His name is Rodney. He would tease me uh, because I came from a fundamentalist background, and there's a lot of uh, sort of scripture worship in, the, in, this, in that background. And so he would tease me. He, he even uh, had drawn up for me one time a set of gold hands. He, fortunately, he didn't have it sculpted for me. That would have been going over the top. But he had a set of golden hands holding a Bible uh, painted up for me or drawn up for me so that he could give it to me and, and say, Here, here's an object for you to use with your idolatry of the Bible. Bibliolatry is what they called it. Anyway, what he called it. Uh, it was, and I, I, you know, we joked about it. We teased back and forth, and I could take the, the ribbing. But he was right. I still... I still had a lot of that in me, that it was more talk about how confident we were in Scripture 
than it was about what the scripture actually said. We, we never just stopped and opened the Bible. I mean, I, it's not true that I never did this, but not enough of just opening the Bible and saying, here's what it says. Instead of opening the Bible and saying, you got to believe this, you got to believe the whole thing, and you got to believe from cover to cover, and here's why you ought to believe it, and here's where it came from. I mean, all of that's fine, but at the end of the day, if you're not doing what it says, what difference does it make if you believe what it says? You don't even know what it says. And so all the focus in the world being put on the word doesn't in any way imply that we're actually obeying it. And so, you know, and and you would think this would be obvious to us. You would think that in reading the New Testament, but again, then we'd have to read the actual content of it over and over again and sort of get the picture. You would think that it would be obvious to us that, in you know, if you look back at the Hebrew tradition, which was given to us, which is what was, it's what Jesus was rebuking when he gets to the New Testament, right? The Hebrew tradition included memorizing all, practically the entirety of the Old Testament, but certainly more than almost any of us do. I, I know one guy, a guy named David Groden, who may know as much scripture as people knew in the Old Testament days. He's, he's great, by the way. I love his, love his uh, recitation of scripture. It's just, it just pours out of him all the time. I, I love it. Um, that, anyway, and I am picking him out to say, I, I love that about this guy. I love that, that about you if you're listening to this. The, anyway, the Hebrew tradition had that built into it. So we memorized scripture like crazy in the Hebrew tradition and then recited it and recited it together and venerated scripture in such a way that it was treated almost like an idol. Oh, we have to separate these holy words from the unholy words and we can't uh, com- you know, uh, pollute this book with contact with another you know, and so on. All of that was there, and yet consider the rebuke that Jesus gives to that society and that leadership when he comes bringing where the real hope lies. Hey, who loves Jesus? Those who obey his word. That's what he says. They obey me. They don't just say, oh, I, we love your word. Oh, we didn't we say your name? Weren't we? That's not what it's about. It's obedience to his word that he talks about. And so you would think that we would recognize the importance of this, or that I would have, maybe you have, a billion times over. But wow, every time I hear this pop up, uh, I just, mm, I get a little uh, nervous because it took me so long to settle in on it. One of the things I learned from studying Luke's gospel, for instance, to give a specific application to this, is that we are most like the Pharisees as they're condemned in the New Testament. Now, they're holy people and righteous people, the, the most righteous one in their societies, ones in their society. That we're most like the Pharisees in the way Jesus condemns them when we use the scriptures, which are given to us so that we'll love our neighbors and love the strangers who are among us as much as we love ourselves. That's what the scriptures command us to do when we use those scriptures to accomplish the opposite of what they teach. So, you know, the Pharisees were saying, the era of the Pharisees commanded to love the neighbor and the stranger as if they were themselves. And the Pharisees say, well, since my neighbors and certainly these strangers, these Gentiles don't measure up to the standards of scripture, we can judge them and therefore exclude them. That's what a Pharisee did. And it's, it's so, it's mystifying to me that people who study the word their entire lives end up making statements and practicing their lives in a way that say, well, of course I love God and I love people, but those people look at the wickedness in their lives and the the very scriptures that command us to love them as if, as much as we already love ourselves, that, that they use, we use those scriptures to point at those people and say, but I'm not gonna love you you do not get to be included in this. That's a terrifying thought that we fall into that. So that relationship is one of the ones that I would say I've learned something about uh, in all of this ministry. Um, let me, so I told you I would come back to the, to the humor idea um, at the end, but I think, you know, this is going to take more than one, more than one shot for us to get to, so more than one episode. And so I, I want to give you one little bit more, but then I'm going to, but then I will, uh, you know, cut it off here, separate the train here, whatever you want to call it, and then we'll come back and finish it in the next episode. So I, I will say this, whatever else we're doing, 
we should remember this. And I, and I was alluding to it just now and talking about not being pharisaical. And, and believe me, not being pharisaical is a command I need to obey. Uh, I am uh, the guiltiest among us of allowing that to creep into my attitude about a lot of things. So I, I don't point my finger at anyone else without realizing the four pointed back at me, as meaningless as that statement is. Anyway, the point is, I, so, so let me end this way today and simply say this. It's not super confusing to figure out the things that we ought to be homing. I'll use that expression of it this time. Homing and honing are two different expressions of the same point. Homing in on our obedience. You know, so am I doing ministry the right way? Gosh, it's so hard to tell. It's not really that hard to tell. If we constantly come back to these statements, he has shown us. It's a, Micah is so adamant about this. I just love his expression of it. He has shown us what is good, oh man. And what does the Lord require? But to do justice and to love mercy and to walk in humility with your God. Not, those are not complicated. We, ha, we do backflips trying to translate loving mercy into excluding this person and that person from our church because you can't really love somebody if you tolerate their sin. We, we just, we convert it into other things, but oh, wrongheaded. Just take it the way Micah said it. Look, he's already told you what he wants. It's not complicated. If you don't do it, don't blame us for not telling you. Love mercy, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Or the great commandment. And I mean, what Jesus says is the greatest of all the commandments. Love the Lord your God with all you are and love other people as much as you already love yourself. And if what we do in our ministry doesn't serve those ends directly, then we ought to admit we're not really doing ministry. Or preferably stop doing those other things and get back to what matters to God. I suggest we do the latter. And we'll talk a little more about this in the next episode. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.